are blessed with is peace. And peace comes through learning. Peace comes through understanding. And um, it, it, very same idea is in Psalm 29. This passage, Daniel chapter 2, our verse today, 20 through 23, really encapsulates that. It's like a psalm, Paul. Like we, we, read, we have our devos in the morning in, in the psalms, and we always say the psalms have this, there's a notable pattern. But even when the psalmist is crying out, God, why would you allow this wickedness to continue or complain against God? Um, in the end, you can't help but praise God. Well, this passage starts out by praising God, and it ends with a praise to God. So verse 20 and 23, it's, it's surrounded with praise. <clears throat> and I'll read it again. It's Jan Daniel chapter 20. It's, it's a response. Now, Daniel, Daniel, we talked about last week, Daniel comes into Babylon as a young man. <clears throat> um, and... He's there. There are four of them uh, that are brought into the king's uh, great court where they're going to be educated for three years and then stand before the king. And Daniel, he, he comes from the nobility of Israel and probably had a pretty good life uh, as somebody who comes from means, we would say and then finds himself likely his family was killed in the in the siege and daniel ends up with uh he ends up being transported to babylon and his whole world gets turned we would say gets turned upside down and yet the attitude of daniel is remarkable now we read it, when we, anytime we read a narrative, we just accept the story. It is, we read it and we kind of just go along with the story. That's what the story says. But if you consider, uh, I don't know if I'd be so gracious uh, if I had to leave my comfortable compounds uh, abruptly by force <clears throat> and then be taken to a strange land. Um, I had my house guests uh, that left this morning were um, they spent time in Lebanon and so we were talking about you know some of the common events that we had and um, I said when I, I spent the summer in Nepal and I read all kinds of books on the political structure you know they try to prepare you you know whenever you go into a, a place and I had never been out of the, you know the confines of the United States and the next thing you know I'm on the other side of the planet just the plane ride alone was terrifying to me uh, but it worked out okay but um, it's um, you're in a strange land and everything is strange not because they don't do the same thing or they don't have the same people it took me three years in China to realize there's nothing really any different here <laughs> than back in the States. The landscape is kind of similar, you know, the, the people are the same, um, but our mindset is different. And so when I was in Nepal, everything just looked so different. Uh, but uh, quickly I was asking one of my house guests, he's nine years old, if he, if he can uh, read and write in Lebanese. And he said, no. And I said, well, a lot of the signs in English? He said, yeah. <laughs> I said, That's the problem when we travel a lot of times. We don't have to learn the language because uh, we, we just have English. But here is Daniel, just uprooted, uh, taken out of his comfort zone as a teenager and taken to a foreign land. But remember how it ended when they had their training and then uh, Nebuchadnezzar brings in the, the, the four uh, do you remember how much greater they were than all the rest of uh, the folks that went through the three-year school? It's about ten times better. Ten times better. Um, so, I, I say that to say this. Ultimately, if you're going to find peace in your life, you need to have understanding. And as Q said in the announcements today, um, 
you know, put in your calendar. You know, it would really be good if we would orient our life around what God wants and just, just a little change of perspective of um, how, how we live. Otherwise, the events that are happening in our lifetime, as we're going to see from, from Daniel here, um, when things change, they're just completely disruptive. But if we know God and we know his kingdom and we know his promises, um, then we can have great peace. And we talk about that in our class in Revelation on Wednesday afternoon. Great peace. How, how can you have great peace at a time when the most disgusting human events are taking place? The persecution and, and slaughter, wholesale slaughter of Christians. It's, how, how do you have peace in that? Well, Daniel, the decree goes out. Nebuchadnezzar is king. He has this terrifying dream. What's so terrifying about a statue? Well, I don't know. I've had dreams that terrified me, and they weren't as big as a statue. <laughs> the little things terrify me. And I try to tell Mark, hey, you won't believe this dream. And it's like, it's terrifying. And as I tell him, he's You're terrified of that. <laughs> It just doesn't measure up, right? But this is a, the statue is terrifying, so much so that the king can't sleep. And, uh, well, you start going without sleep, um, among other things, you can get a little aggravated. Uh, now, we've been going through, in Genesis on Wednesday night, we were just talking about the Pharaoh had a dream that Joseph interprets for him. And our discussion on Wednesday night was about how in the world does the king of Egypt, how in the world, think about this. Again, it's a narrative. We read it. We accept it. But think about this. Seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine. Can you imagine a leader saying, okay, I like what you said, Joseph. We're just going to store up grain for seven years. Do you think there was any opposition to that? What in the world? You're going to listen to him. <laughs> you know? I mean, if it's anything like our political scene today, I can't imagine people going for seven days following anything right, without you know, conflict. But seven years. What in the world happened to the Pharaoh's mind that upset him so much that he would hold to the seven? Now, in the seven years of famine, oh, yeah. Mm. I guess we were right. Yeah, it really paid off. But, so I say that because Nebuchadnezzar has this dream. It's a terrifying dream, and his sleep is leaving him. So much so, so much so, if we put this into perspective, when he calls in all the, they call them wise men, really? Wise men. The magicians, the sorcerers, the enchanters, the Chaldeans. Uh, all these wise men. He calls them all in and he, and he says, look, I have a terrifying dream. You tell me the dream and interpret it for me. And they say, wow, we can't do that. It, it, no, no great king has ever asked the wise men to tell him the dream. And he says, look, I know you're stalling for time because I told you, <laughs> you're going to tell me the dream. I'm tired of you lying to me. So you're going to tell me the dream, otherwise I don't believe you. And he said, well, we can't do that. So imagine, now Nebuchadnezzar has the authority to say, all the wise men in Babylon are going to be put to death. So how terrifying, how serious is this? So when the captain of the guard shows up to, to take the four, Daniel and his companions, uh, to kill them. So what's the urgency about? And, and Arioch, Arioch, the king's guard, explains to Daniel. He says, well, good grief. Go tell, go, go tell the king, man, you know, we can handle this. And so he gets together with uh, the, his three companions. And uh, they, they, they bring this matter before God. So Daniel says, uh, after it's revealed to him in the night, in verse 20, Daniel says, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. 
He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. To you, O God, God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise for you have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we have asked of you. For you have made known to us the king's matter. So if we're going to have peace, we need to have praise. We need to praise God. And by praising him, that means we accept he is God. Um, so I want to put something out here um, because it, it, it inevitably comes up in our classes. And especially as we're going through Revelation. Revelation, I'll just, I'll just say it plainly, it's not a secret, it's not that you guys don't know this. Revelation, Daniel, and Ezekiel are the most abused books in the Bible in our day and time. You have people telling us that Daniel is about things that haven't happened yet, Revelation is about things that haven't happened yet. Um, and, you know, here's the statue. If you're, if you're unfamiliar with the statue, this terrifying statue that Nebuchadnezzar sees has a head of gold, and it's brilliant, by the way. And it says he's frightened because it's so brilliant. But it's a head of gold. It's got a bright head of gold. And then it's got this shoulder and arms of silver, and then this bronze midsection, and then th there's this iron thighs going down the legs, but the feet are iron, comes down to iron and clay mixed together so that the toes are mixed with iron and clay. Um, and so it's a terrifying image. So you can imagine when Daniel goes before the king and tells him, wow, this, here, here's what this image is. Imagine what must be going through your mind if you're the king. Who can, who can come up with something like that? All right, you got my attention, number one. So Daniel goes in, and, and look what he says uh, in verse 27. Uh, Daniel answers the king, and he says, No wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days, your dream and the vision of, uh, of your head uh, as you lay in your bed are these. And, and by the way, when we were going through our Acts class on Sunday morning, I asked when we were doing Acts chapter 2, if you'd read Daniel 2, Isaiah 2, Joel 2, Acts 2, they all go together. And there's that latter days, latter days, when, when Peter got up to speak on the day of Pentecost. And they say, what's going on here? And he said, this is what Joel spoke of. These are the latter days. Get that. The teacher would say, nail that down. All right. To you, O king, in verse 29, as you lay in bed, <clears throat> came thoughts of what would be after this. And he who reveals mysteries made known to you what is to be. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I have more than all the living, but in order that the, the interpretation may be made known to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your mind, right? Um, when Pharaoh had his dream, it was important that the interpretation was made. And so Daniel's saying, God didn't give this to me. I didn't come up with this. By the way, um, when God prophesies, okay, this is not a prediction. This is a pronouncement. This is not, gee, I think things are, you know, we have many modern day prophets, you know, over the years too that predict things. And then they get all this acclaim if their predictions come true, as if they're, you know, they, they somehow magically conjured it up. Um, it's not hard to predict some things in the future because we're creatures of habit and we continually operate in cycles, all right? And there's really, 
Solomon would say, nothing new under the sun. So it's not too difficult to extrapolate, you know, or find out, hey, these are the times I'm living in, here's where we are in the cycle. I can give you some ideas here. But God doesn't predict. God pronounces. So in verse 31, he says, You saw, O king, and behold, a great image. The image was mighty and exceeding brightness. It stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. Okay? So we need to understand it's so frightening that he's now, ooh, he's got attention. So, verse 36, uh, this was the dream, now we will tell the interpretation. So again, uh, in the dream, if you read through, it's the head, what I just told you, the gold. But, but also, look in verse 34, he says, um, as you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Okay? So there's, there's a stone that is cut out, and it just comes in, it, it hits this statue, we call it a statue, right? It hits this image, uh, and it breaks it into pieces. So... Verse 35, the iron, the clay, the bronze, silver, and gold, all together were broken into pieces and became like chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried it away, so not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Got that? Now, in my mind, when somebody says, okay, there's a stone that hits an image. If you, you could see that in your mind. There's an image, um, and as we talk more about the image, Iron and clay don't mix, mix very well. When clay dries, it hardens, it's brittle, right? So you could see if you hit that structure and you start busting up the base, <laughs> that thing's coming down. But in, in, in your mind, it's like, you know, all these metals, these precious metals, as they go up in order of value to the gold, they break, which seems odd, but in a dream, it's okay. It's terrifying. Right in the dream, but they all break down and whoosh, they blow away, and the stone becomes a mountain, and the mountain fills the whole earth. Can you see that in your mind? A mountain filling the whole earth. You know, in my mind, it's like this. It's almost like the the board that we put up there that uh, um, Sarah put the clouds and the mountains on, and, and it's like a silhouette. In my mind, it's like the silhouette that just goes and it fills the earth. Um, somehow, it does it. So let's interpret this dream. Verse 37, you, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven uh, has given the kingdom, the power and the might and the glory, and into whose hands he had given wherever they dwell, the children of man, the beasts of the field, the birds of the heaven, making you rule over them all. You are the head of gold. All right, here's what we're going to see. Four kingdoms. Four kingdoms. And you, Nebuchadnezzar, are the head of gold. You're the first kingdom. That's Babylon. Okay? I'm going to tell you how easy this is. It's Babylon. Babylon, you're the head of gold. Verse 39. Another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you, and yet a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over the earth, and there shall be a fourth kingdom. That's how I know there's four kingdoms, right? Not just because there are four different elements in there, but they say four kingdoms, all right? He says, there are four kingdoms, strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all these. Um, but, verse 41, watch this. And as you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay, partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom. But some of the firmness of the iron shall be in it, uh, just as you saw iron mixed with soft clay. And 42, and as for the toes, and I, I, I just wanted to hone in a little bit on this verse because it's silly, all right? Can I just say it's silly to listen to people interpret the toes? Oh my goodness, as other kingdoms. There's four kingdoms. You know, if we would just use these a bit, see with your eyes and hear with your ears. There's four kingdoms. I know there's ten toes. That doesn't mean there's ten kingdoms on the, on the feet. Oh my goodness. They're partly of, what it says is, they're partly and they're brittle. Look at verse 43. Is, 
uh, as you saw, the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage, but will not hold together, just as iron doesn't mix with clay. So you can see the kingdom, in this fourth kingdom, is not a very united kingdom, okay? That's what the toes represent, okay? Uh, and in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Now, the peace, verse 45, just as you saw that stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, a great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, the interpretation is sure. Now, let me ask you, because the king's going to fall on his face over this and pay homage to Daniel. Does it last? Because Daniel chapter 3, he's going to build a whole gold image to himself. But anyway, he extols Daniel. You are great and wonderful. Makes him head. Uh, but anyway, <clears throat> this interpretation is sure. Nebuchadnezzar is king of Babylon. Babylon's the first kingdom. Is that easy to understand? Okay, you with me? The first kingdom is Babylon. The fourth kingdom is the kingdom when the stone comes out and strikes it in the feet and sets up his kingdom. What kingdom did the Christ come? And I know you weren't in our class this morning, so I'll excuse you, but you know the answer. You just don't think you do. <laughs> When did Jesus come? Who was occupying Jerusalem at the time? Rome. Is there any historical doubt that Rome was the power, the kingdom, when Christ came? Now, you, if, you, if you reject that Jesus came and you don't accept the testimony, well, that's a whole other argument, all right? But I'm talking about people that accept Jesus. You've got the first kingdom and you've got the fourth kingdom, and they're sure. Babylon's the first. Roman is the fourth. Rome is the fourth. That's it. End of story. Now, the other two kingdoms in between, I'm going to tell you exactly who they are. It's in Daniel chapter 8, verses 20 and 21. If you want to just skip over to that chapter, you can see uh, Daniel chapter 8, <clears throat> verses 20 and 21. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I just wanted to see this because God doesn't predict God pronounces and we can have peace when we accept what God tells us he's got this 820 says as for the ram you saw with the two horns these are the kings of Media and Persia and the goat is the king of Greece so after Babylon came the Medo-Persian Empire and then the Greek Empire, and then the Roman Empire. There's your four kingdoms. Christ came in the fourth. That's it. This is not, Daniel was not written for 2025, 30, 32. If you want to have peace, here's my point. If you want to have peace, you need to accept what God says. People today are looking for predictions now in the future what's going to happen in the future and we're studying in the book of revelation and revelation is telling them what happened everything happened and now i made a contrast in our class that the, the in in revelation 15 there's a mention of the song of moses and the song of moses is talking about is referring them back to the exodus when the 10 plagues happened on egypt they were 10 physical plagues they led, Moses led a physical exodus out of Egypt. They crossed a physical Red Sea. They went to a physical Mount Sinai, got a physical law. They went and crossed the Jordan, displaced the Canaanites, set up in Jerusalem uh, as, their, as their center. Um, that's history, world fact, okay? Uh, that happened. The exodus that's being discussed in Revelation is of a spiritual nature and the seven plagues on Rome 
are spiritual. Janice asked, you know, when he said, did, when he poured the wrath out, did all the fish die in the sea? No, it, it, it's spiritual. God did everything for our learning so that we would know he is God and he can be trusted. And what person is not afraid of the dark? And anybody who says, I'm not afraid of the dark, they're lying, Emma. <laughs> Everybody's afraid of the dark, right? At some point, and if you've never, there, there's a place I'd like to go there, but it's very frightening. Uh, if you've ever been in a real dark room where there's no light and no sound, I've been in a sound room, it's terrifying just when there's no sound because what you hear in your head is scary. <laughs> but, but God knows. He says, God knows what's in the dark. He knows. God knows history. He's playing it out. And I said in, in our study in Revelation, when God is talking about all this apocalyptic stuff and Armageddon and the world coming to an end, could it be that the saints in heaven are witnessing God's judgment to them who don't live in the time that we live in? God is satisfying their cry, God, how long will this happen? How long will this go on? But for them, the judgment is sure. But for us in human time, it takes time to work itself out. But no doubt, the four kingdoms, they, they, they've never risen to superpower status again. But the kingdom of God fills the whole earth. And I'm saying this because God sets up kings and removes kings. We've been very comfortable here in our environment with, oh, this is, I, and I talk with teachers in China that, that come over to China and they're talking to the Chinese people about our political situation. They don't care. It's chit chat. <laughs> you know, they don't. And, and I was thinking when I was talking to our house guests too, I say when we were kids, I always point to Claudia because we were kids in the same neighborhood. Um, yeah. We didn't hear news all the time and, you know, good grief, it's raining out, it's a wet summer, last year was a hot summer here, but there's forest fires going on all over the place. It'd be nice if we could share some of our rain with them, uh, you know, it just doesn't work out that way. Um, God gave us this for our learning. So when Jesus comes and he demonstrates the power of God so we could recognize him when he comes, and then he resurrected to confirm who he is. Um, and then he gave us the church. And um, what I want us to know is, and I've said this before, and I really want us, and I like what Q said this morning in his prayer and, and in our announcements, is that, I'll say it this way, we live in the church age. God gave the gospel message to his church to be salt and light to the world. There is no angel or modern day prophet coming to spread the good news. That's the job for the saints. The apostolic age ended. And I believe, this is just me, I'll probably take some arrows for this, but I believe when Jesus bound up Satan for a thousand years, it was because the apostolic age, when Jesus had his ministry and the apostles had their time, there was demons, there was this active world being played out that we're not seeing, you know, the miraculous things uh, with the frequency back then. I'm not denying that miracles happen. Good grief, we pray to God. God still exists. But I'm saying for our learning, for all intents and purposes, that all ended when, when Jesus binds him up. We're not living in the apostolic age. We're living in the church age. I just want us to know that you can have peace in your life by accepting God's will for you and then his purpose for you. And orient your life around church in whatever form that takes. And I'm not saying you have to show up at every event. It'd be nice, but no. I'm not saying that you have to come to every event and that you're a good Christian if you go to all the church events. I'm saying orient your life around God and his word and learn from them. Do you know some people just can read these things and accept them just the way they are? Um, and accept God is God, and we comment about some of the things we hear on the radio. But uh, others, I wasn't that way. I have to scrutinize everything, and I have to make sense of everything. 
Um, but there's no limit to the depth. How far do you want to go in, in discovering God and his greatness and his wisdom? Uh, you will always be satisfied in the word of God. When Jesus told the woman at the well uh, that this, this water, this living water will well up in you and, and, and into eternal life and you'll never thirst again, you won't go anywhere else for answers. Here are the answers. Uh, God is who he says he is and there's great peace that comes from knowing uh, that God has got everything worked out. When we have this peace that Alan just prayed for, when we have this peace that people can see in our lives, then they'll want to ask us for the reason for the hope that's in us. Remember in this world you'll have tribulation but take heart, Jesus said, I've overcome the world. Let's not, we were talking in our class this morning in Acts about how easily men are whipped up into a frenzy and want to get into this mob mentality and then all this confusion is going on. Um, if, let's have peace and understanding so that when people try to disrupt you with all the things that have never happened before, nothing, it's never been this hot. Did you know that? It's never been this hot. It's never been this cold. It's never been this wet in July. It's never, I mean, we live in unprecedented times. It's never been this bad. You know, I marvel at the people that say this, that, that tell us that we have had ice ages and age of volcanoes. Then what, was it not hot during the volcanoes? <laughs> you know, it was not cold during the ice age. Uh, so it's pretty remarkable, but I don't know. Uh, if you're not in the kingdom of God, and when I say that, I'm talking about his church, the kingdom that fills the whole earth, if you're not in that kingdom, if your citizenship is not in the heavenly kingdom, um, then you need to find out and prepare yourself and learn from the word. Uh, if it's true and right, then you'll know it. I think God created us with enough intelligence to work this out. But like I said, most of the, dis the, the, most of the problems that we have are not because of what the word says but because of what other people have said about the word all right so it's pretty straightforward um, I have somebody else I'm encouraged to bring to our Wednesday study uh, to the same thing somebody's very skeptical about church people um, but no nope, we're just we we'll read the Bible let's see what the Bible has to say uh, so let's be people of the word I'm so excited uh, Speedy's coming on Friday uh, we're gonna have him for mid-August and um, so he'll be here the banquets coming up um, this school is it, I, I am so excited for the opening of this school as, as Q said you guys are all invited we, we'd love to have a good showing the people the board all the board members are going to be here you know invite people to come in uh, we're gonna have a great celebration but this is about uh, learning and then chapel's going to start I got a whole exciting thing to tell you guys about that uh, to get us ready but that's for another week uh, if you're not in the kingdom and you're not excited and you're distressed by the times that you see all around you um, then let's let's start changing our mindset uh, and putting our trust in God and finding the peace that God promises us if you're not there um, yet uh, then we encourage you to come up uh, talk about it uh, ask questions uh, seek somebody out like the activity people here as Q says seek them out get some answers but get some answers uh, we have an invitation song and I love the song selection Q today these songs have just been you know even his prayer this morning uh, Q Q is one that just says God said it that's the way it is I love it I love it it's right and then the songs just sing it out um, Sing the songs from your heart uh, and listen to the words they say as we sing to one another our invitation song.